Hey all, and welcome back to Fuzzy Duxy Gaming. Now it's been a while since my last video, but after some time away, I've decided to refocus and start producing some hopefully helpful content for Path of Exile. It's mainly going to be aimed at novice to intermediate players who want to improve their PoE gameplay experience. Now it made sense to start with league starting since we're now about one month away from the next league. So in this video, it's going to be split up into four sections. The first section revolves around what to do before league start to ensure success. The second looks at tips and tricks on leveling during league start. The third looks at how to tackle mapping and progression to end game. And then the last section is going to look at external tools and sources that are available to you to help you on your way. Now it makes sense to start at the beginning, which is picking a build and knowing the bare bones of this build. Now there are numerous builds throughout the game, some make amazing league starters and some take a lot of work to get off the ground. The first thing I would recommend once you pick your build or skill that you want to play would be to look what the build's going to look like when you finish the campaign and start mapping and how much improvement does it need to hit at least red tier maps. It would be no good for example playing a build that once you get to maps needs 30 to 40 exalts to get the build clearing red maps comfortably and maybe getting the early bosses clear. Ideally for a league starter, you want to look for a build that can transition to the end game gradually and affordably. Okay, so we've picked the build that we want to play and the example that we're going to go through in this video is just a simple summon skeleton build that I've put together. What we can do now is look at what we can do to improve our league start even further now we've picked our build. Now the first thing would be to know the skill tree or at least the first few passives that you need to pick up. Being able to just allocate skills from memory saves a huge amount of time over having to constantly check a build guide to see where you're meant to be going. And then this doesn't matter as much as you level up higher as you won't be leveling up as frequently, but try to memorize at least the first 30 points or so of the skill tree. An easy way to do this is just to memorize the first few notable nodes that you need to path to. So in this minion build, for example, I want to path to Arcanist Dominion, then I want to go to Enduring Bond, and then I want to go to Discipline and Training. The next thing is to know what gems you need and when you can pick them up. Now I'm not going to go through the whole of this build, but let's just look at our main minions, which will be Zombies and Skeletons. So at the very start of the game, I'm going to start with two three links, which is Holy Flame Totem, Summon Phantasm and Combustion, and then Summon SRS, Minion Damage and Melee Splash. And then once I hit level 12, I'm going to get rid of the SRS and I'm going to bring in skeletons. Then when I pick up four links, I'm going to replace my flame totem with zombies and I'm going to link them with minion life, summon carrying golem and feeding frenzy when they become available. I then want to add predator support to my skeletons and then pick up a melee fizz gem to slot in for bosses instead of melee splash. And that's the links and they stay the same until we pick up a five link, which can be when we're well into maps. Now knowing this helps me as I can be on the lookout for gear with either the right attributes or the exact colour sockets and this saves time hunting for gear at various vendors. Now this leads us nicely onto loot filters. So to make your levelling quicker and smoother I would recommend building a custom loot filter to only show the gear that's going to be used in your build. I'm going to bring out a separate video on how to design your own loot filter but in the meantime there are lots of good custom filters already available at filterblade.xyz along with instructions on how to load these. Essentially, you want to highlight currency items that are used for your build and hide a lot of stuff that's irrelevant or worthless. The worst thing you can do on League Start is go in without a loot filter. The penultimate part is gonna look at vendor recipes and the crafting bench. Vendor recipes are a great way to upgrade weapons. If you have a two-handed ax build, for example, you wanna get used to upgrading your weapon via the physical damage recipe or equally, if you're a fire spell build, make use of the fire wand recipe. Now these recipes are available for the most part on the PoE wiki. Along with the vendor recipes, ensure you're utilizing your crafting bench, especially to keep your elemental resistances up. You can craft elemental resistances on any gear with an open suffix, and that includes plain white gear. So considering it only costs one transmute to get up to 20% resistances, it's often worth doing even if it's just a short stop gap to keep up your resistances. And then the last part of this section is really to advise you to practice Acts 1 to 3 a few times before the league starts if you can and try to incorporate everything we've gone through so far in this video. 
I know from experience it will massively speed up your leveling time through the first few acts. You can also install an application timer like Live Split to keep track of your times, or just type forward slash played into the chat to see your total time. So we've now done a good chunk of work and server permitting, we're ready to get stuck into League Start. Now I'm going to go through some tips and tricks that have helped me drastically reduce my time to get to max. And the first one is movement speed. And as we all know, movement speed in Path of Exile is key. Be constantly on the lookout for movement speed boots and quicksilver flasks. You get two quicksilver flasks very early on. The first one is in Tidal Islands in Act 1 and the second is from the Great White Beast quest at the beginning of Act 2. I'd recommend always picking these up as they're vital to getting through the early acts quicker. If you do find a spare Quicksilver Flask, you can trade it in along with Movement Speed Boots and an Orb of Augmentation and you will get back Movement Speed Boots with the next tier of Movement Speed. Be aware that these boots will be magic and will only have Movement Speed on them. Smoke Mine is also a really good Movement Speed gem for getting not only a Movement Speed Boost from the teleport that you get forwards, it also gives you a boost for 4 seconds after usage. Now the easiest way to use this gem is to have the gem on your normal movement speed button and then put detonate on your left click move button. This basically makes it a one button skill and negates the need to use a separate detonate button. So the next thing we're going to talk about that we're going to jump in game to do is try not to spend too much time in towns and talking to vendors. Now this is something that I was really guilty of early on and I wasted so much time doing it. So as an example, let's say I've just come in from Act 1. I've got my two three links that I need, but when I come into Act 2, I check all the vendors for possible upgrades. That might be maybe movement speed boots or it might be the next upgrade for a weapon or I might go to Yina and see if she's got a better belt or some better rings. But when I come in town, I'm perfectly set up to actually carry on with the act. And I really don't need anything from the vendors. But I used to get into the habit of always checking them in every act. And I would also do it halfway through the acts as well. But when you add all that time up together, it might only be one or two minutes per time. But if you add that over all 10 acts and you do it a couple of times, it can be well over an hour. So what you want to try and train yourself to do is get out of that habit. When you come into a new zone, if you've got lots of stuff to sell, sure, click the vendor, sell your items, and then be on your way. Once you get used to doing that, you'll notice a massive difference in the time that you can cut off your leveling. And then alongside this, also don't complete unnecessary quests. Now what I mean by that is, there's a few quests in the game where you may need the reward for your build, but you may not. If the reward you get from completing that quest is not something you need for your build, then there's no point completing that quest. If we look at Act 3 for an example, this quest is still uncompleted on my character, and that's Sever the Right Hand, where you have to kill uh, General Gravisius. Now it can be a bit of a tough fight early on, it can take a little time to do it. If you die, you've then obviously got to travel back to him. He basically provides a selection of skill gems. They're not ones that I needed for my build, so I didn't complete the quest. And I'd recommend you do the same. If you don't need the reward from this quest, then don't complete it. And the same can be said for the library. Now this is a quest that I used to do automatically, and it can take a fair while to complete the quest, gather all what's needed and return, and hand it in. And essentially you get access to skill gems that the other vendors don't sell at this stage of the game. However, if it's not a gem that you need at this point in time, you do get access to all the gems in Act 6 once you complete Twilight Strand. So unless the gem from the library is something that's integral to your build at this point in time, consider skipping this quest and just carrying on. It will save you some time. And then completing quests goes hand in hand with collecting rewards from the quests. What I mean by this is, there'll be various acts. Seven is a good example where you go through and in each zone pretty much you collect a skill point quest. What I used to do is every time I got the quest completed, I would go back to town, hand it in, spend time allocating my skill points and then carry on. And then get to the next zone, kill this boss in Dread Thicket, for example, go back, get my skill point. I'd then travel onto Causeway, get Kishara Star, go back, get the skill point. Now I've got myself into the habit of just really going all the way through the zone, building up the skill point quest. I get to Vile City and get the last checkpoint in the zone. I'll then go back to Bridge Encampment and all my quests in at once and then allocate all my skill points. And then the last part which is really more around gearing than towns, is try and keep your main link within either your helmet, your body armor, or your gloves. 
The reason being, you want to be able to upgrade your boots for movement speed and your weapon for damage as soon as you come across them. You don't want to have to rejig all your other items because you fit your main skill into one of these two items. If you allow yourself the skill in one of these three items, it means whenever you find an upgrade, you can just put it on and you can carry on questing. You don't have to then spend a long time looking in either vendors or trying to chrome items to get the colors back to fit your skills in. So we are going to move on to Blood Aqueducts in a little while and discuss different strategies that people use there. But before we do, I just want to touch on layout. Now speedrunners often say if you knew every layout to every zone, you'd be way, way under leveled and you'd end up in a lot of difficulty. Having said that, there are some layouts that there are definitely advantages to knowing where to go. So we're just going to touch on a few of them today. So now what we're going to do is look through a few zones just for a couple of layout tips. They're not going to change your life when leveling, but they will help maybe speed up a little bit in certain areas. So there's a couple in Act 2 that we'll go to. So we'll start with the Chamber of Sins. This one's really simple. When you get to the waypoint, the pathway that's closest to that waypoint is going to be the way to the exit. So if we go down here and there we go, that's the exit there. We're now going to stay in this act and we're going to go to the Western Forest. Now this would be where you either help or kill Alira or you kill, uh, you also kill Weaver. And the way this area works is there'll be a path that goes around the waypoint. The opposite side of the path is where Weaver is and the waypoint side of the path is where Alira is. So if we quickly run up here, what you're looking for here to know you're going in the right direction are these spider webs here. Because um, that obviously signals the fact there's probably a spider nearby. So we'd run up and then we would get to Weaver's Chambers there. So we'll just quickly dash back to the waypoint. And then we'll go down and then we will find Alira. Now it's not always necessarily directly down. It might be to the left, it might be slightly to the right, but essentially you know the area that you're looking for. So there we go, there's the opening and there's Alira. And that's always the same. Alira is always the waypoint side and Weaver is always the opposite side of the road. So they're probably the two easy ones in Act 1 that you can pick up and basically follow every time. I'll just quickly go to Scepter of God because this isn't a layout but it sort of helps you if you're one of these people that runs around the area blindly looking for the exit. Um, as you can see here we come in in a corner of the waypoint and it would be the same if you came up through stairs. You would come in through a corner. There's obviously four corners of the tower. The exit is always in one of the corners. It's never in the middle or on the side. It's always on one of the corners. So there we go. We go out to find the exit up to the next level of Scepter of the God and it's in a corner and each level of Scepter of the God is exactly the same. So here we've come in bottom left corner and it's just easy to look. So is it top left? No, it's not going to be top left. So again, we'll run through. It's not top right. So we'll then run down to the bottom area here and it's going to be in the bottom right corner. And there it is. And it's always the same. It's always in one of the corners. We're now going to go and look at Val City. Rather than go into the waypoint in this area, because that's the bit we're trying to find, I'm going to come in from the causeway. So we're going to enter Val City. And essentially this area, there's only three or four different layouts for this area, but it's always directly opposite the entrance. So here we're coming from the causeway. We basically just want to run all the way up here as far as we can, basically. Once we come to like a wall, that's when we know we need to look for the waypoint. So again, we'll just go up. Make sure we're always in line with the waypoint. I'll just kill a few things to get Quicksilver Flask. And again, we're just going to keep going up. And there we go. We can actually see the waypoint from there. So we keep going up until we can't go any further. And we've got this kind of castle wall with all the plants. I can actually see the waypoint from here. So I know I just need to go left or right. And then cut in. And there we go. And again, if we then look at this map, if we scroll down, we can see that it is a direct line up from the entrance and this area is always the same. The last one we're going to go to uh, is going to be in Act 8 and we're going to go and visit Grain Gate. Grain Gate, again, is an area that's quite large. It's basically loads of interconnecting rooms. But what you're essentially looking for in Grain Gate is an entrance with dead bodies around the room. Now, as you'll see in this one, there isn't any. In one of the layouts that you go into, the first area won't have any. But if you go left through this first room, 
you'll see that there'll be dead bodies on the other side here just to show that that is the right way so again we're just going to go through the rest of this area and then we're going to look for the next dead body and there it is there on the floor so i know that that's the way that we need to go so we'll dash through here quickly and this would be where you get to the legionnaires and then essentially we're looking for one more entrance with dead bodies and there there's the unfortunate chap there so we'll keep running through here and then this should be unless there's a vile side area this should be the exit and it is up here so that's kind of a few quick layout tips that i think help um, speed up your game uh, as you're going through uh, but that covers it for layouts we'll move on to the next section Now we're just quickly going to touch on league mechanics and whether you should interact with them and it's really different for everyone but what i'm aiming this video at is people that want to cut their time down but still want to be geared by the time they get to maps and league mechanics can be a good way of doing that essentially i would say league mechanics are split into three types the first type such as delirium doesn't really affect your level in experience at all because you just open the mirror at the beginning of the zone you run through, when the mirror expires, your loot drops. Yes, it makes the zone harder, so it is going to add a little bit of time to your experience, but really it doesn't affect uh, the whole level in flow. Then you get a middle ground, a bit like Ultimatum, where the mechanic does appear within the zone, but it takes time to do. So for this, for example, I've got to stand in stone circles for, let's say, four to five rounds. That could be three or four minutes that I take to do the lead mechanic in just one zone. And then you get ones like Delve and Heist where they take you completely out of the level and experience. You go to a different zone. It's a totally different mechanic than just killing mobs. And I, I'll be honest, I totally avoid those. I tried one Heist and one Delve when I was leveling just to see what it was like. And then I basically didn't do any again until I got to maps. For the Delirium end, I would always complete it. Why not? The mirror's there, run through it. If I found it was just too difficult for my character, then I might miss a few zones until I was a bit better leveled. But essentially, loot dropped at the end of the encounter, and it was definitely, definitely a good thing to do. And then for the middle ones, like Ultimatum, um, I really played it by ear. Do I need the first item? If I didn't need the first item, I wasn't doing the Ultimatum. And that's the way I handled it. So I'd go through the zones, right, I don't need a crew chopper for my build, I'm carrying on. I might come to the next one, okay, that's two cow swords, I'm 100% doing that first one. And that's the way I dealt with it. And it was pretty much, bar a couple that went three or four rounds, it was either one round of ultimatum or none. And I would say I added half hour to 45 minutes onto my leveling. That's just to share the way I handle the lead mechanic. Everyone deals with it differently and it's just finding the way that suits you. Now we've talked about the lead mechanic, the last thing we're going to look at in this part of the guide is going to be blood aqueducts this is really the last area of the game where you might farm other than quarry which really is dependent on the league mechanic so i'm not going to go into that too much but blood aqueducts is where people get to and then they might decide to do a bit of farming you essentially get three different types of players really in regards to the league and that would be the first type of player would basically come in whatever level they are they're just going to carry on through the zone because their goal is to get to max you then get the opposite end of the spectrum where a player might farm here till 75 and onwards with the reason being they want to farm lots of rares to get a chaos recipe or they might be farming divination cards to trade in for a tabular rasa. And then you get the in-between who might use the zone to level up maybe five or six levels with the goal of just doing a bit of farming, maybe a couple of divination cards and just really getting their gear ready for maps. And I think the happy medium is to fall in the middle I don't think it's worthwhile farming for a tabula rasa because it's so heavily gated by RNG. You might be lucky, you might farm one within an hour, you might be unlucky and it might take you three hours plus to farm one. Realistically in that three hours you could have been done into maps and farmed way more chaos than that tab is worth. And then ultimately the other end, because I'm not a speed runner, I'm not bothered about getting to maps as quick as possible, I just want to get there in a reasonable time. I'll never just run through this zone because what I find when I do it is that I then don't have the resistances or the gear or the weapon to then tackle maps once I've killed Katava. So I like the happy medium of spending four or five levels running through BA, getting gear to cap my resistances for when I kill Katava and just making sure I'm adequately geared to go to maps. Now, it's 
totally up to you how you want to treat this zone. I really just thought I'd share with you the process I go through once I get to Blood Aqueduct. So now let's move on to maps. We've just killed Katava and we've been sent to Ariath. Talk to Lani and collect your two skill points and then go to the top of the area to collect the movement speed recipe. At this stage, it's a good idea to type forward slash passives into the chat and it would tell you what skill point quests you've left to complete. Now at this point, Kirak will give you a few small side quests to complete before hitting maps. When completed, meet Kirak on your hideout and collect a map from him as a reward. Now run this map, go back to him and he will unlock the Atlas. I'm not going to cover Atlas progression strategies in the video as there are loads of good ones around on YouTube. What I will do is link Grimrose video in the chat which covers it really well. Our goals in a nutshell are basically complete a map in one of the corner regions to unlock Zana. Zana will then come to your hideout and she will sell you maps. Whenever you activate a daily mission from Zana, her inventory will reset and she'll have even more maps for you to buy. This is where the bulk of your early Atlas progression is going to come from. I would also recommend unlocking Maven as soon as possible. Now to do this, you complete a T3 map and then the Envoy will turn up and then look out for Maven in T5 maps. Once Maven's been activated on the map device, complete her three boss fights as soon as possible as you can't unlock the other regions until this first one is done. Other than this, you're essentially looking to complete as many maps with bonus objectives as possible to progress your Atlas. We're also going to look at trading and pricing items along with how to complete maps quickly. Now the way that I map is that I set up a dump tab with a buyout of 5 chaos. I ID and put all the items I've looted in there and sell them as whispers come in. If I get a lot of interest in one item early, I'll then individually price check that item. Now this strategy changes as you get more to red maps as you're going to want to price check every influence item you get on a good base because it's likely worth more than 5 chaos. So what I'll do with my 5 chaos tab is when that's full, I'll start another one. When the second one is about half full, I'll change that first tab to 3 chaos. A bit later, I will drop it down to two. And then if still there's items that don't sell, then I vendor them. And then I reset the process. So I've always got tabs going that will start at five, then three, then two. It takes no management at all. I don't need to price check. I just sell the items from those tabs. Now you may miss out on some value for some items, but the amount you save from not having to price check every item is really important. Now, obviously when you're IDing the items, you will see if you get an amazing item. Let's say you ID an item and it's T1 life and T2 res is all over on a leather belt. You're going to see that and you're going to pull it out. You're not going to blindly throw them. You just literally ID, put it in tab, ID, put it in tab. But if you see an amazing item, you're going to see that item. And because of all the auto whispers people get set up, you're always going to know that you've underpriced it because you're probably going to get 10 or 15 instant whispers to buy that item. The next thing to look at is how to run your maps efficiently. Best way that works for me is to run maps in bulk. What I will do is take four to five maps out of my stash and prepare them all. So let's say I was in a region and I had five maps left to get my Conqueror fight. I'll get five maps, I'll prepare them with alchemies, bindings, vials, whatever you want, and then run them all back to back, only stopping to ID and dump items. I find it's much, much quicker to map that way than just pick individual maps out of your tab, prepare them, and then sort your gear out when you finish the map. If you still need a five or six link when you get to maps, I'd recommend running corrupted areas because these can often drop these items. Essentially, you put a sacrifice fragment in the map device and it brings up a corrupted vial side area. Remember, you can also recolor any corrupted items you get using your crafting bench with chromatic orbs and vial orbs. Now, this might not always be uh, something you can do, but because items are corrupted, they often drop with funny colors. So you might drop an int base in a vial area, but it's got all red and green sockets. If your build is six blue gems, for example, you could recolor that using chromatic orbs and vial orbs, and you've got a good chance of hitting your colors. And then last of all, always ensure you're completing your master missions when you can. They help with XP, map sustain and loot, and are a great way of subsidizing your map income. Now, if you've got this far, thank you so much for watching, and I hope some of the tips and tricks helped you out. What I want to do now is just quickly run through some external tools to look into to help you with your league start. 
The first, which everyone is probably using anyway, is Path of Building. If you've not used this before, 100% recommend downloading and installing it, as it's the main way people share build guides through paste bins. The second would be the main Path of Exile website and the trade section, as this is where you're going to be searching for items to buy during the league. The next program I'll recommend is called PoE Awaken Trade, and it's basically a trade macro that can help you easily and instantly price items. It's really handy if you're someone who likes to price check a lot of items. Now it goes without saying that Filter Blade is an essential tool for downloading and creating loot filters, so I recommend again that you look into it. There will be a video coming shortly on how to set up your own filters for that. And then the last one would be YouTube and Twitch. There are tons of amazing content creators on both Twitch and YouTube who put out some really good content on a regular basis. And that covers off the whistle stop tour for league starting. And I hope the content has helped and there is plenty more content to come. If you've liked what you've seen, please like, subscribe. And if you want to know when a new video goes out or I go live, then click the notification bell. Thank you so much all for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.